Welcome to Gate Crashers, a podcast dedicated to kicking open the door to your next favorite thing. Our mission, our creed, our code is this, to make all nerdy things more approachable and accessible to everyone. We want you to find a universe that you'll fall in love with. Hi, I'm Mike, and I use he, him, his pronouns. Hi, I'm Dan. I use he, him, his pronouns as well. Today, we're joined by nerdcore legend MC Lars. Lars, how you doing? That's such a nice introduction. Thank you. I, I use he, <laughs> him, his pronouns too, and I am grateful to be here um, with y'all remotely. We're so glad to have you. Um, and we, we are glad to have you, but uh, we have to start with uh, a hard-hitting journalistic question that we always start with. Uh, what is your favorite sandwich? <laughs> uh, you know... I was vegan for a long time and, and the pandemic has been hard. So, but I've tried to be vegetarian. So last night I had an incredible sourdough and Swiss cheese sandwich, which hit the spot and it's simple. It's fast. You're in and out of the kitchen in like three minutes. So yeah, there's just simple food like that. That's my favorite sandwich. Sourdough right Swiss cheese sandwich. I've not heard that one before, Dan. <laughs> that is new. <laughs> that is new. We get we get like tons of people say Rubens like all the time. Always. We we used to we used to name these episodes based on the sandwiches. <laughs> and then it just had to stop because we every episode was like Rubens with so and so. It was kind of getting sexual because Mike is like hot, juicy Rubens. Like, all right, <laughs> relax. <laughs> well, so if I were to, my favorite sandwich would be like an avocado, sriracha, Swiss cheese on a focaccia loaf. That would be like mm. the bomb if I had time, v- right? What is a what is a focaccia loaf? Focaccia bread, I a guess. Fo- is, focaccia. Okay, I'm saying it yeah. wrong. Yeah, and I said loaf. I wouldn't eat a whole loaf, but it's like that bread that looks like it <laughs> Why has. Why not though? Yeah, you never know. Pandemic. It has like a. It's kind of. <laughs> it's kind of um, soft, and it has looks like it kind of. It's like the Swiss cheese of bread. Focaccia is yeah. Oh, I think I've seen that. I know what you're talking so, about now. The way you make it, Mike, is you basically drench your pan in olive oil. You put the dough in, and then you drench the dough in olive oil. Um, and then you like get your little fingers all in there um, and make it kind of um, weird because you're making a weird kind of looks like a brain. Like, I don't know the texture looks like of a, a brain. human yeah. brain. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wish I could share my screen. I've just Googled it, but it's uh, it's the most textured of breads. And it's it's a winner. It's very I think of like you have it. People often have it with olive oil. Well, you just I guess you just you said that Daniel, <laughs> but people dip it in olive oil and vinegar and you're good to go. Welcome to Gate Crashers, a podcast about bread. <laughs> <laughs> my, Mike, it is the jam. It is a very, very good bread because it's like soft, but it's got texture. <laughs> All right. Wow. <laughs> well, I wonder I'm if I could, have to try this focaccia bread. I was going to say I could post great. in the chat, but you, y'all are, you're not trying to like click on links and go on Google. We have work to do. <laughs> I appreciate the focus. <laughs> It's, it's I'm gonna post it anyway. Unmatched. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at pictures of Focaccia right over here, honestly. <laughs> Focaccia anyway. I got I gotta wait for it now. Like sometimes you can put like little tomatoes in there and yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's I've it's seen dope. This. It's dope on as pizza. Oh my gosh. Like Oh uh, yeah, I think I have I think I've had pizza with this type of bread. Okay. All right. That's the bomb. All right. Yeah. Holler. All right, let's let's get back to the <laughs> <laughs> the interview. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll uh, I'll get us back on track here. So for our listeners, uh, I'm gonna li- uh, quickly list off some names: Jarrett Reddick, Perry Grip, Paul Gilbert, Weedus, and Weird Al Yankovic. Um, you've worked with a crazy diverse group of musicians over the years, and that list goes on. What's it like collaborating with so many different artists? Are there musical or creative lessons you've picked up from working with each different one? Um, thank you, Mike. That's a great question. I, I mean. Yeah, those are some, yeah, thinking about it, it's cool. Like, and then people in hip hop and other 
genres. I, I think the trick to getting people like, well, Weird Al's that's a whole nother story, but like getting some, getting someone like Paul Gilbert on your record, it's, you need to be able to have confidence in the fact that since hip hop is this postmodern art form that builds itself on being kind of this incongruous culture that connects different things in this cut and paste way that it's going to, it's going to benefit the project to have something that might seem kind of unorthodox, right? So you always have to pitch the idea that their involvement is going to make something that benefits from, from being more than the sum of the parts. So having the confidence that like what they're going to add is going to make it better. So that, requires having a fluency in their kind of musical DNA. And which is why I love Weird Al's ability to do this with pastiches and polkas that sum up certain yeah. eras. You have to invite them in, in a way that makes them realize you understand them. So it's about, you know, I, it's about having the right project and having it be as done as possible before you pitch it to them, because it means you value their time. So I've, I've, it's, I've learned to be professional about it. And I've learned by people who have passed or who've ended up not being on my records what not to do. And so I think, you know, especially early in my career, I, um, yeah, I learned how to approach people. You got to also have this boundless optimism that they're going to do it and just imagine they are. Cause if you come in like, uh, yeah, my records, so it's kind of dumb, but you got to be like total PMA and be like, this is dope. And um, I love that. The PMA. I love that. You need that. And I, and I try not to pay people. I mean, I pay, you know what I'm saying? Like I'll pay them on the back end. Some rappers will want like a grand advance, which I think is pretty typical, but like, you know, mostly if someone wants money just to do your record, they're not going to give it their all. You have to suggest that after they've already agreed to do it. That's something else I learned. Like people, if you, okay. if you give, give them like 500 bucks to do a verse, they're going to phone it in if they don't know you or care about you. So you have to like, think about that because you got to build a bit of a relationship, like a rapport with them. Yeah. Like you like. two obviously have maybe not that good, but <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> um, so, Oh, Dan, go ahead. Before, before you go to the next one, I know Mike, I, I know I can speak for you on this one. Mike and I's relationship has built a lot on weird Al. Um, and I know he's a personal hero of yours as well. What was it like working with him? So I'll tell the backstory real quickly. I, I had wrote a, written a song called Download This Song six months before Al did Don't Download This Song, right? So so Al had see, Al's manager had seen an interview I did for ASCAP or something where I talked about how he was such an influence. And Al wrote me. It was like, yo, you sa- I appreciate you saying nice things in, in the press about me. Just so you know, on my Straight Out Linwood record, I have a song called Don't Download This Song, and it's totally a coincidence. And I was like, wow, you wrote, you, you messaged me. This is crazy. Uh, like, <laughs> and then we had this pen pal friendship and he, you know, and I eventually asked him to play on my second record and, and he did, but it came from the fact that he had seen something through his manager. I had credibility because like, you know, he, he, what he always said, this was like 2005 or four when he saw it. And he was like, you were giving me props at a time when like, it wasn't cool to publicly be down with him because you know that was after Eminem had said no on the lose yourself video and he felt like I'm talking to him that people young people in the industry like it wasn't you know it was he obviously had this resurgence with white nerdy and sense but like there was this period between Amish Paradise and white nerdy where yes I guess guess running with scissors it was dope the saga begins was dope but his four iconic moments were eat it smells like Nirvana uh, I guess Amish Paradise and White and Nerdy, like those were the right. th- the four. But um, and of course, to the fans, everything he does is gold. But like, I think right? He, yeah, he was, that's Dan and I. That's our <laughs> opinion yeah, there. Yeah, but like the average the average music fan would know those four maybe. And so I guess mm-hmm. just just to say, like, it was tight that the timing. It was all about timing. Like that he heard about me then, and then you know I see him when I'm in L.A. and he sends me his Christmas card every year and he thanked me in um, mandatory fun. Cause I helped produce one of his music videos for that. So shout out to him. I'm curious to hear about your, both of your stories and appreciation which, of him. Which music video did you work on? Lame claim to fame. Have you seen that one? Oh so yeah. He, yeah. So my friend That's Tim, awesome. he did, who did the, my robot kills video directed that. And I was on set helping with helping produce it and, Helping, yeah. I I didn't direct it or anything, but I was I, I helped out on set, so I got a shout That's out awesome. on the album. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike, I 
for our backstory on that, I want to say it's probably watching Amish Paradise, the music video on your like Windows 98 in your parents' basement. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I we we had a a 19, I think it was like a 1998 Acer Aspire computer that took three and a half minutes to start up and it was awful. <laughs> um, but yeah, it eventually went into the basement when we got a newer computer and, and Dan and I would sit down there watching, I think, what did we use? Like Yahoo Music back yeah, then Yahoo to watch music, music videos? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Shout out to Yahoo Music. <laughs> yeah. And then Dan and I made like a, a mix CD eventually that had a bunch of Weird Al on it and a bunch of other random stuff. Um, like I ran over the Taco Bell dog, if you remember that, like old internet song. Um, I missed that one, but I, 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 like, I imagine it's amazing. I'm going to look that up. That was a golden era. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't you think the uh, Taco Bell dog is a little bit problematic? <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like In 2021 on that CD would not, would not play well today. I'm sure. Yeah. But, but then maybe, there was also like John yeah. Williams on it, like the Jaws theme in Jurassic Park and stuff like that. All we were weird place. kids. Yeah, we were. We're um, weird people now, though. Like, <laughs> now we do parodies, parodies of like Life on Mars in this show. So <laughs> nothing's really changed. We've just gotten, well, you've gotten better at things. So my crazy idea is we just can run farther with them. <laughs> that's what's so, up. Yeah, that's, I mean. Oh, go ahead. So, okay, no, I don't, I, sorry to interrupt, but like, that's cool that you could bond on. Uh, like, that's what's, people who like Al, especially like from that era, you know, it's like one of the weird elements of like monoculture that was also subversive, but also shared by many people, but also just niche enough to feel like you're on the cutting edge of something to like him. And the fact that that dude spawned, spanned, well, spawned a whole generation of artists, but spanned so many generations. Like no one will ever yeah. have that influence again, just due to the whole, uh, like mm -hmm. the, the fact that cultures shifted so much. So that's, that's, that's amazing, right? Yeah. I yeah, Absolutely. Honestly, the people who have made the biggest impact in my life, every single one of them has known every word to Albuquerque by Weird Al. So, like, that's a running theme in my life. That's me. <laughs> yeah. You guys are so, so tight. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you have, so speaking more on collaborators, you've, you've collaborated with all those amazing artists, but you also have, speaking of being tight, right? Like, you've got a tight group of, people that you seem to collaborate often with like, uh, like Schaefer, the dark Lord and mega ran, um, when working on projects together, how do you guys create together? Is it kind of like a, like a loose improvisational jam session where you guys just show up and just start playing off of each other? Or is it more like, do you come prepared, prepared with ideas that you kind of just start listing off and see what, what vibes or how does that work for you guys? Yeah, it's a good good question. I mean, the best albums, like my two, fa my three, I did three albums where I, two albums in the EP where I worked with specific artists. The first was the Digital Gangster record with YT Cracker, who's a OG nerdcore guy. And then I did the single famous EP with K Flay, who's killed it in, in the alt rock indie world. And then Megaran and I did Dewey Decibel System a few years ago. But what made all those records special to me is that we actually sat down in the studio and you know, came with some ideas, but we wrote and recorded together. I think so often with hip hop, people email stems their verses, you know, and that's fun. But but you you can't make great art, I don't think, without having that fungible, tangible element of being in the studio together. So, for example, with um, Digital Gangster, I'm sorry, with Dewey Decibel, Megaran and I just emailed a lot, and I kind of took the reins on that project because it that was going to be a solo record, and I was like, oh, it might be fun to include a friend who's I, who does really good literary raps who I respect and who I could tour with and make money off that record with. So we, we wrote, we did all the demos and then he came to New York. I was living in Brooklyn at the time and we rented a studio for a week and just treated it like a job all day. He got there in the morning, left really late and just recorded. Uh, but it was kind of like a jam session because uh, Megaran would give me, I'd do a verse and then he'd be like, Hey Lars, have you thought about this cadence? And he's Megaran has such a great, fluency with hooks. Like he'd be like, have you tried this? And have you tried that? And I'd give him ideas and we had people coming in doing verses. And so when a project feels a little chaotic and a little, um, scattered, it's going to be dope, especially if you have people on the back end producing and mixing and, ha and making it sound professional. So, you know, that chaotic energy can be kind of cleaned tamed. up and tamed. Yeah. yeah. Cause it otherwise, otherwise, like I found it can be kind of, could be fun, but it's not going to, 
come out and it's not going to come out well. So you have to, to have that work, you have to have your business and production team lined up so you can enjoy it. Kind of like being a kid, just be crazy. And so having someone who can be, be wild with you and be very uh, spontaneous is, um, yeah, that's how that works. So I work with a lot of the nerdcore rappers because, well, first of all, I think a lot of them are really tight, especially the ones I work with a lot, but that's obvious. But the reason why is because <laughs> our fan bases have found each other through the algorithms of Spotify and YouTube now. And back in the day, I started to notice that with Pandora. Like I did, I was one of the first artists to work with MC Chris after his Aqua Teen stuff blew up. And he, we did a track together because we met at a college show we both did. And so a lot of his fans started finding me through Pandora. And that was the cool thing about Nerdcore. And it still is like the way the algorithms introduce us to each other, which then results in things like people coming to see us more if we tour together. So right. the, the, the kind of the AI of constructivist um, learning and like the way culture is shaping right now has, has made this team, like the Avengers have to come together because we all kind of want to keep doing <laughs> this. But you know, there's you less- really know the you really know the audience you're talking to right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think of it like that, and that might be a bit self-aggrandizing, yeah. but it's you know, I'd rather see like the Avengers move like you know the, the well, MC- only if you think the Avengers are all that great. <laughs> well, okay, if you like the given you like the Avengers, the Avengers <laughs> movies, I would rather watch. I would rather watch. Um, I don't I'd, know an Avengers movie than like the Ed Norton Hulk. You know, I'd rather I'd rather watch you and Weird Al and Jarrett Reddick like standing and the cameras panning around you in a circle and there's like epic Alan Silvestri score happening. I'd rather watch that personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's tight. That sounds tight. <laughs> I I want to touch on a, a point you raised in there that uh, really uh, hit home for me. Um, and Dan will know what I'm talking about here. Uh, there's a band I listen to, a rock band, and I don't want to mention names because I don't want to be like that, but. I've followed them for years and I've known through discussion with fans and, and like studio behind the scenes interviews, they do stuff like that, that they're, they're very big on this kind of like puzzle piece kind of idea of songwriting where they, you talked about sending stems back and forth and they'll do that where they'll just kind of send each other ideas. Um, but sometimes I feel like on their more recent work, it ends up, you listen to the album, but it just doesn't feel quite as cohesive as you think it should. It kind of feels like they just slapped a bunch of things together. Um, and so I just really wanted to touch on how cool I think it is that like you, you made that point about how it is still important to like get together in a room with people and, and really like try to build something in that moment because it, it just, I think it feels more organic that way, you know? Um, yeah, no, you're right, Mike. And that's been like, what's so, uh, you know, one of the many tragic things about the covid pandemic because i i miss being able to get in the studio with my homies like i've done verses for people during it but it's just it's not the same and yeah um you you see that with bands you see that with groups where it does also feel like they're punching the clock if you if like you're sitting in your closet and you're just gonna wrap a verse and then you're gonna go i don't know the grocery store it's different than like okay let's go to this one place and put everything into it and it's just a different it's it's just kind of it reflects how digital culture has um, kind of asked us to compromise our humanity for the sake, for the sake of efficacy and, and, and a short-term profit, which, you know, it, it, that's a whole nother topic, but I'm curious to hear what this band is, but I'm kind of, I think it's kind of tight. You didn't put them specifically on blast. Yeah. I mean, one band I it's will the mention. <laughs> that's the Wiggles. He's going through a lot right now. I yeah. <laughs> And I mean, one band I will mention um, is like, I think of like the, the Foo Fighters when they did Sonic Highways and how Dave Grohl talked a lot about like wanting to go to a city and spend time there and see how that influenced the music as opposed to like you were saying, like, yeah, I guess I recorded that verse. Now I'm going to go to the grocery store and it just doesn't lock you into the process as much when you know you're about to leave to do something, you know, arguably like monotonous, right? Like just doing grocery shopping. Um yeah, my best records have been with that in mind, especially my solo records. I've, I've made them in different cities. And now being a father, it's like the luxury of doing that seems different, but I'm also open to what that um, chapter will bring in terms of inspiration. But I think about Rush, like Rush recorded all their best records in different places and they were very intentional about that. And that's interesting about Dave Grawl because that's someone who was forced to be flexible just by virtue of, of being involved in so many projects and his asset yeah. being an adaptive 
everyone says how he's one of the nicest guys in the music industry, being an adaptive, uh, positive person who was able to just roll with, roll with the flavor as Wesley Willis would say, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that's cool reference. Yeah, no. Well, so speaking of like rock, like other, I'm thinking like other genres, um, you don't, you don't seem to really have any boundaries in terms of genre. Like I've, I've heard you kind of all over the place. Um, how do you manage to pivot that easily? Do you, do you listen to a large variety of music when you're not writing or, or while you're writing? Is that, I don't know, is that something you do while you're writing to get inspiration? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, Lin-Manuel Miranda and, and um, quoted Weird Al saying that, no, he's, he, his Weird Al quoted him saying like, the reason why parody works so well is that it becomes the clothes of genre that a song wears, right? So a good song is a good song. So like whether you're wearing a jacket or a hat, how you accessorize that song reflects all the cultural and stylistic things that define, you know, the broader, the broader picture. So I always think that like context is important. I grew up listening to a lot of music. I think a lot of people in our generation did. I think that Napster ultimately was a big influence on that and how culture shifted. But I grew up, you know, loving, loving hip hop music, loving um, like West Coast punk rock and thrash music and loving funny music and strange music. And so all those things kind of morphed together. Oh, and loving jazz, loving how jazz could kind of teach me about music theory. So yeah, those are my touchstones, right? Like, like, um, I, and I think it's fun to, 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 to bring what, what we were saying earlier about how hip hop is a subgenre that allows you to reference and connect with other things. If you fail to do that and every track sounds the same, has the same 808 and synth line, like some people can do it. Some people can have the same, same aesthetic and it sounds dope, but it can also be boring. And I don't, I, I do, I'm like, I'm diagnosed with ADD. So I have to always surprise myself. Otherwise I'm bored. You know what <laughs> right. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel that. Um, I mean, it's this, this whole interview is, is already been so interesting for me because Dan can tell you, I hip hop and rap, they are so out of my wheelhouse. Um, and I've never written anything in that way. Um, and so leading to the next question, I cannot try, I cannot imagine trying to fit so many words into a song as a lot of hip hop artists like yourself do, mm. um, because it's so out of my wheelhouse. And like when I sing, my style of singing happens to be pretty like legato, like a lot of drawn out notes. So I, I usually don't have to write a lot of words to get through a song, um, but what advice would you have for like young budding lyricists who want to try to stay fresh and creative and, you know, keep their, increase their vocabulary? Yeah, that's a good question, man. I mean, I think the, funnily enough, the, I, I realized I could rap when, um, this is so nerdy. My, my qu choir in high school did a medley of rent songs and there's a song called love. Dude, Evo me Ant. too. <laughs> Okay, you know on La Vie Boheme, there's that part. It's like a rap down, rap breakdown. He's like, adventure, TDM, no family, boring locations, darkroom, perfect faces, egos, money, Hollywood, and sleaze. They're talking about like everything <laughs> yeah. that, and I, and I had a solo where I got to go up and just like spit that. And I worked so hard <laughs> to learn that. I could even do it 20 years later. But you know what that <laughs> is? It's breath control. It's just, right. da, 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 yeah. da, da. And, and, and I was on the swim team and I still, you know, I, I'm trying, I, training to run a marathon now. And so like, I really take physical fitness seriously. And so therefore it's, if you can figure out where to breathe and you have right. strong breath control, anyone can rap. And in a way it's easier than singing because, well, some people, some singers might disagree, but like it's, it's, if you have a sense of rhythm and a sense of timing, um, and you can breathe and you can work, it's a lot of practice. Like I remember I, I practiced that a hundred times. And when I learned it, I was like, Oh, I could, I can do this. I mean, so my advice would be to t find, if you're trying to rap, I guess Hamilton is a great modern example. Like find one Oof, of the yeah. simpler songs from that. Um, not just, not that any of them are simple, but some are easier than others. And just, just practice one eight bar phrase. Okay. over and over and over and over and over again. And you'll, and you just, it's muscle memory. And then you find that, um, and with writing reps. So I do these workshops where uh, people hire me, hire me as a consultant to help them produce and, um, market their albums. And a lot of it's hip hop, but some of it's other genres, but 
What I talk to them a lot is about learning where not to speak, where to have silences. And we always look at Miles Davis, especially the kind of blue record as a touchstone for that. Yes. Learning where he doesn't play is just as interesting as where he plays, right? And mm -hmm. all the other artists on that record, all the guests, it's such a crazy lineup. So learning where not to rap, learning where to be silent, and that's where you breathe. And I think that's kind of a, interestingly enough, it's a something that we can apply in a more um, bird's eye view about how to how to live our lives. Learning when to talk and learning when not to, learning when to listen. And I think all that stuff just comes together. And, and one day you'll be like, oh, I actually can rap. And and when you're uh, your authentic self, that's the magic alchemy of it, you know? And I think that it takes a while, but nothing's going to come quickly. And I, I hate to be like a uh, old man millennial, but like you're, you're gonna, <laughs> you know, you want to put out your first song and get a million plays on YouTube, but you're going to be putting out a hundred songs until you get a song that, that people are stoked about. So just take the craft seriously and be patient. Um, so that, yeah. that's kind of a very long answer, but I think that's how, yeah, how I think people should approach anything rapping or anything that's technically complicated. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic answer. If, if, if it had to be long, it had to be long. It, it works. It's, I like that you mentioned uh, like Hamilton and Lin-Manuel Miranda in there because uh, you were talking about when you first realized you could rap. I, I think one of the only recent things I can think of that I was like, yeah, I, at, or at least at some point I could rap it. I may have forgotten how to by now, but the, uh, the rap that Dwayne Johnson does in Moana... Oh, um, yeah. In the middle of uh, You're Welcome. Like, there was a point, I think I could maybe still do it, but there was a point where I could do that whole thing. And I was like, oh, I can actually do that. <laughs> like, so you're a rapper. So yeah. I, I get, thank you, I guess. Uh, <laughs> that, no, that's a cool, that's a really good example, dude. That's like something that'd be a great entry point because the interesting thing now is how rap, it was looked down on, especially in the back of the day, everyone saw it as a fad, but now it's proven its longevity and it inserts yeah. itself in a way where like that rap is pretty technical and pretty dope. And um, yeah. like, it's, it's, and, and, but it's a good, if you could do that, you could do, you could do uh, who's, who's dope. I mean, someone like machine gun Kelly, he's just, he chops when he's not doing pop punk, which is the tech nine chop style where you're just quick, 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 breath, quick, 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 off tempo. Right. And so it's anything like, like, yeah, pop culture is a great entry point for, for hip hop because the skill level has been raised so high. You know, so. this is also, this is like a lot of new information to me and I'm loving taking it in. This is great. <laughs> uh, so, all right. So I want to, I want to shift a little bit with the, with these questions, but what, what is your favorite fan interaction you've ever had? Oh, like a fan of mine meeting. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, you know, just like a good ceiling fan from home Depot or Lowe's, <laughs> Le, but preferably Lowe's, but <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <sighs> Okay, yeah, I'm sure I, that's a that's a great question. I'm always stoked when, like, this ha this happens a few times when it, when I meet like a young kid who has done a very fun interpret like draw like fan art like of my cartoon characters or something, and they're kind of shy about it. And when you show them how much you appreciate it, how their face kind of lights up. Like kids, kids really. There's, they still, you know, it's like believing in Santa Claus. Like we don't have to get into that, but like concerts are still magic to them. And, and to see that light and joy in their eyes and to like have them manifest, this is something I gave you. I'm thinking specifically in, in Columbus last tour, uh, two siblings or cousins brought Schaefer and I, this really, really amazing art they drew of us. And that meant a lot. So yeah. Cause I, when I was a kid, I would draw my favorite artists and stuff and think about how I would feel if I gave it to them one day. And we really pride ourselves on being so accessible and like open and at merch the whole time. So, um, it just means a lot when, yeah, like I'll say that experience in Columbus last tour, um, shout out to those amazing artists, these young kids who that's, drew, they drew for us. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. That's just great. I love hearing stories like that. Um, <laughs> So, hey, we, we've gone over this like extensive list of people you've worked with, but who's a dream collaborator that you haven't yet worked with? Mm. Well, I, you know, my, th my three favorite rappers of all time are uh, KRS-One, Violent J from ICP, excuse me, and E-40. And I love, and I've worked with KRS-One. So I, I, I played the Gathering of the Juggalos a few years ago with Mega Ran, and we met. Jay and Shaggy and I'd love to work with them if it ever 
if ever were like something that made sense. But I'd also love to work with E40 because I'm, I grew up in the Bay Area and he really defines uh, that whole style of being unorthodox, being wild. He has amazing breath control, his his performance, his everything, his spirituality. I'd love to work with either E40 or, or ICP. That would be dope. And I feel like one day I will. I'm putting it out there. Why not? I'll make it happen. That's so awesome. All oh, right, man. here I come. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that leads into something I wanted to talk about. Hatchet Chat, which you've been doing for a bit. For those who don't know, it's a series about Insane Clown Posse and the label and everything they've put out. What do you think makes ICP unique as musicians? Wow, these freaking questions. Y'all, this is like one of the best podcasts I've done in a <laughs> while. Uh, um, that, yeah, so I could go on and on. I mean, we every every few weeks we drop an hour long analysis of one of their albums. My, my shout out to MC Snacks, who's my homie in Canada, who produces the series. What I love about ICP is three things. The first is their imagination. And um, the fact that like they took this whole world in the way that C.S. Lewis made Narnia a metaphor for his um, belief in his spiritual belief. ICP made this thing called the Dark Carnival, which is this metonymy for um, how we find salvation in this fragmented uh, postmodern messed up uh, digital culture and how we find redemption through it. So they took something like very um, cerebral and made it very accessible through their imagination and through their, and just through their creativity. The second thing I love about them is how they were able to independently build their audience and, and build their business based on just, just being true to themselves. And the third thing that's so impressive to me about them is how since, since the, since the late eighties, or early nineties, they've really been committed to this, this joke of being too, insane like murderous clowns bringing vigilante justice and and not necessarily caring about being the most mainstream rappers and just being unapologetic about it so it's three things their imagination their business sense and the way they stuck to the joke makes them amazing and the fact that their music is so always changing and and it's just there's so much of it there's a lot they've done some stuff that you know i like more than other stuff but um yeah, those guys, honestly, if you want to talk about inspirations, I really started rapping because I had this vision of, when I was young, I'd draw, I'd draw a picture of myself like as an alien, and I thought about how it would be so tight to be on Psychopathic Records as a rapper whose backstory was like I was a space robot who ra- rapped about <laughs> crazy stuff. And so I, I um, was going to call myself Android because my real name's Andrew. And I was, I had this whole backstory. So I was like, that was one of my, that was one of my, when I was 16, I I went to, and I went to see them with my friends and the show was so tight and I, they changed my life, man. And then when I got, I've opened for them twice now and getting to share that story, getting like a a great reaction from the juggalos. Cause that community is so loyal and they've embraced me and my homies and uh, gosh, I, you know, and not, you know, everyone's, different with their beliefs. I'm not trying to push anything, but as a Christian, the ICP, like I, I'm, I grew up as a Christian and ICP had this weird twist on the six jokers card where they revealed that the whole thing is this metaphor for the Christian allegory and that they're just trying to spread the awareness of God in this, in this world that is a little lost. And that surprised a lot of people. And I think People know that about them, but it's not really like the center of their story necessarily in the press. But to me, as a man of faith, that's tight as heck. Like that helped me understand some things in a something. I feel like the dark carnival is real in the context of what it represents. So that's, did that answer your question? That was a yeah. long answer. I, I, I specifically asked this because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the juggalo community because I have. I don't listen to their music. Like I've, I've listened to pretty much all of their albums, but it's not like my flavor. But the Juggalo community itself is something that has highly interested me since. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that story offline. But what do you think? Uh, why do you think the Juggalo community is such a tight knit group of people who consider themselves outcasts? Yeah, man. I mean, socioeconomically, they were the first group to achieve any sort of platinum status to rep kind of the, um, you know, if we look at the history of the Midwest post-World War II, um, Japan and 
Germany's auto industries were decimated, right? Being having lost the, the Second World War. So Detroit had this huge upswing in production and economic revitalization with all the auto manufacturing. Then when Germany and Japan got their economies back together, Detroit suffered. And there was this whole economic downturn in Detroit, which led to this, this later cultural renaissance with people like Eminem and the underground. And so ICP spoke for this legion of people. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say like largely, you know, their, their fans are um, diverse, but like originally largely, you know, uh, I would say working class white people from the Midwest who didn't have a group that spoke specifically to them and took elements of hip hop culture and reggae cult, like r reggae influences and other things that they could relate to and threw them all together. So they spoke for a group of people who were not, who didn't have, you know, didn't have a band that spoke for them and they did it in a way that was original and they did it at a time in history where that, that generation, the kids of the people whose parents had felt the fallout of the economic changes post-World War II, um, they, ha they, they didn't have a band like that just because of history. So I think that's who they spoke for, you know? I need to, Dan, I just want to pause for a second, acknowledge the fact that you just asked a question about the Juggalo community. And then it was like, well, in post-World War II America, like that was awesome. Thank you, Mike. I got a whole like history <laughs> overview. Like, oh man, that was well, that Dan's Dan's brother Jake, one of our other hosts, is a huge, a huge history guy. So I, I think he'll he'll probably love that little section right there. Well, that I mean, and Mike to like extrapolate upon that, it's because um obviously that's why they're so close. Because there was no group yeah. like that that had this that you that you know, MTV their label that that bought them out of their contract when Disney dropped them for being for political reasons or whatever, the label paid a million dollars for MTV sh to show a documentary about them, and suddenly they became this mainstream phenomenon. And so, therefore, that moment was a really special moment. Looking at all the historical factors, and then looking at how that group of people was so tight knit because they tight knit because they rode for what ICP are proud to call the uh, most hated band of all time. And so it was like <laughs> this this ex interesting example of subculture before social media and, and something that survived on the backs of that. And then I fast forward to 2009 when SNL did the whole spoof about their magnets de debacle from the miracles yeah. video, they had this whole status then of this, of all the vice magazine and all the ironic hipster news journalists got behind them. And the magnets thing became a punchline. And as an aside, Shaggy didn't write that line. Jay wrote that line, but Shaggy wrapped it. So everyone joked about how, oh, Shaggy doesn't have a PhD in electromagnetic technology. Oh, Shaggy must be dumb. It became this punchline for this is the working class, uneducated America that um, is is like everything wrong with the country. But guess what? They, they fought against racism. They had a song, mm -hmm. an anti-Confederate flag song on Carnival Carnage. They, they had, they've, fight for justice they you know there's a lot of like good things they do and it's so i love how the heels if we use a wrestling term became the heroes there we go and that they were on the right side of history the whole freaking time and so Absolutely. it's just it's a great story i mean yeah it's the best as a story as a fan of uh as an unabashed fan of creed i can totally relate to being loyal to a band that everyone hates so that's funny <laughs> but I, I do think it's so interesting like even at their shows they have like uh, canned food drives and things like that. Something that I've always found interesting is the whole Fago thing. And it didn't click on th with me until recently. I was like, why do they drink this Fago stuff? And because it's cheap, like it's not, it's something they had access to. Um, I don't want to get too far into the, the juggalo thing. Cause I will talk to you for hours about it. Cause I think it's uh, maybe I told Mike before the interview, I was like, this is one of the best subcultures in the country. Like, they are something that have been so tight knit and care so much about each other that it's always such an interesting thing to read into and meet people who are into it. Yeah. And, and the Fago thing, it's, uh, that's just because repping who you are, repping the pop mm -hmm. they, they grew up drinking. And, um, 
You know, it's, it's, they're, they're not just a joke. It's, you know, I've always been drawn to people who are funny without being a joke. Weird Al's an yeah. example of this. If you can be funny, but then have something to say, like you've got my attention and they did that. And it's going to be interesting what happens when the guys get older and like, like God forbid one of them ever passes, like what's going to happen to the culture, to the subculture. And it's like the Grateful Dead, right? Like never, I would say they're the closest thing our generation has to the Grateful Dead. Jay Z says like he's rap- heads, yeah. Grateful Dead, but the Juggalos are the are the yeah. '90s version of the Deadheads for sure. And that's a great just, way to put that. They're a really great subculture, and I'm really grateful that they've kind of embraced how I've brought this academic um, love to them. And I know it could be my wife in our wedding vow. She said. She said, I'll listen to you talk about anything ICP for up to 15 minutes at a time to show you I love you. <laughs> so shout out to Ashley. That's, that's the real deal, man. I, that's, yeah. I did want I do want to jump off with that um academic thing because you know, the first album of you, the, the first EP of yours that like I if it was a CD, I would have burned through it. Um the Edgar Allan Poe EP was so inspirational because like growing up I was big into poetry and like that wasn't cool. Like people weren't into that. So like having something where I can be like, no, listen, this stuff is really cool. What may, what drew you to Poe rather than like doing an album about frost or something along those lines? That is a a great question. I mean, Poe, I mean, it all started with one of my first rap songs um, on the laptop EP. It was based on the pun of the Raven. Who's that rapping at my chamber door? I was like, Oh, I could rap this because the trochaic octameter is essentially the same. Um, cadence of most rap, right? You have trochaic mm-hmm. octameter or iambic tetrameter. Rap is based on one of those two forms. But Poe, you know, I, I always loved spooky stories as a kid. I don't know if y'all know uh, ICP, one of their first songs, Old Evil Eye, is based on the Telltale Heart. So like, I was intrigued that ICP were rapping about Poe. And I also loved how Poe believed in the magic of sound. Like, like Dan, I'm sure you, you you feel me on this. Like the idea, the, the, if you spend enough time finding the right words with the right rhymes and sound, he believed in the sonorous mm-hmm. ability of of words to transcend time. And people would laugh at him, like Whitman and and Emerson. They'd say, "Oh, you're just a jingle man. You just write songs for kids and spooky stories about birds. Like you're not a real writer." And he was like, "No, my poems are going to be remembered because I really care about the musicality of it." So, if you're making a concept record that 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 whose thesis is to prove that rap is basically is poetry, which now is a very like obvious mm-hmm. thing. And when I first started rapping, the first Raven song in 2003, people we're slowly beginning to realize that. And I think Poe's work reflects that. And I think something interesting about how hip hop serves um, a place in society, it kind of, Chuck D called it the black CNN, meaning that it is a place where people can say things you didn't hear in the mainstream. And I think something interesting about Poe is how, especially in his later works, he deals with the theme of what happens when manifest destiny has a dark side. What happens when you take over the whole country and European people colonize the whole country? One of his poems, El Dorado, is basically is kind of what I'm talking about. What happens Mm -hmm. when you look for gold and you look for, you know, your dream to come true at the expense of other people? What happens when Manifest Destiny and the Gold Rush has a dark side? And I think he was really prescient in a way hip hop is in that the the dark story of of what happens when the American dream goes wrong is a central theme of anti-transcendentalism. And that was something that that Whitman and Thoreau and Emerson were trying to talk about. But you see that in Melville, you see that in Poe. And so, it, you know, I, I have this whole joyful, ha, 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 happy persona. But I don't know. I think if you throw a little darkness and realness in there, you get people's attention. So Poe is just uh, someone who is timeless in a way that similarly, hip hop's agency and the 21st century American culture is. So I, I thought that that EP would be a proof, a good proof of concept for that. So I appreciate you saying that, man, because I, uh, that's one of my most proud things. I would say that's one of my favorite projects and I'm going to do a follow up when I have a minute, um, of like a part two. So that's, so that's a special, that's a special news drop. I'm giving y'all right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that would be, um, I got a lot of words inside of me. They're really hard to get out. But as you said, he like other people were telling them him that he wouldn't matter later on. And for a while I lived in um, growing up 
after like a certain age, I lived in Maryland. And every year they would do the birthday part. Like someone would go to his grave and leave something on the sto- his gravestone and drink um, cognac. But the guy stopped coming, so they started having a party, like the Ed Ground Post Society. And I think they stopped because the last time I went, like they were having money tra- problems. But standing in a graveyard with a bunch of other poetry nerds and seeing this society read his poetry at his grave was maybe the most emo thing that I've ever done in my entire life. But I think it was one of the most emotional moments in my life, seeing people feel the same way I do about something. So those I stuff like this is things I connect with. So I'm I'm very, very excited to hear it's it's coming around again. Yeah, man. And Poe was like talking about the culture that he's created. I mean, the juggalos are you know, Poe was a 19th century juggalo. He spoke for the disenfranchised. He took these stories of heartbreak and loss and created this whole imaginary world. He he was very focused on consistency, imagery, storytelling. Um, he really respected the craft, but he was totally dissed by all his contemporaries. And he's proven his longevity. And so I think that like that story you told about them in the graveyard uh, reading poems and like celebrating his death feels like the the gathering the juggalos (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean in a way it really is um and i know you mentioned it earlier but i really wanted to talk about the dewey decimal system have you always been an avid reader like through your life yeah um my you know my mom was a a librarian is a librarian and um i was kind of you know i guess a lot of the kids of our generation like we were kind of encouraged to play alone i think more than like the generation that came after us, the Gen Z kids. I think there's kind of maybe more helicopter parenting. I don't know, but I think there was a lot of like being alone time. And so I always love reading and I started reading at a young age and um, books, you know, high middle school was particularly hard because I was, I think as many people can relate, I was picked on. I was not good at sports. I, my family moved to a new school and just sucked, man. And I was tall and gangly and um, it sucked, but books, books were, were an escape. And, um, so yeah. And I had a, I had a book of Poe stories that I loved that I started reading when I was like 10, which I might be a little young for Poe, but it <laughs> stuck with me, you know? And, um, but so I wanted to, yeah, Dewey Decibel. I had that idea for the, an album of that title for years and, um, Mega Ran was down to do it. And I, I, I'm proud of that record. You know, I feel like that's my last super dope record I've done in a, in a while. I mean that I'm proud of, I'm not trying to denigrate other stuff I've done, but I think that's yeah. my favorite record yeah. I've done in the last 10 years to be candid. It, it's, I loved it. And as someone who read great expectations and war of the worlds, like at a very young age, I get it. Um, so do you think that putting these things into music, like, is there anything that you try to write into your lyrics when you're talking about lit to try to capture someone to actually read these books? <sighs> yeah, that's an interesting question. And there's also all this weight now where like we realize that the all the all the writers we wrote about on Dewey Decibel were male, I think, and all of them except one were white. And so when you're when you're celebrating the canon of literature, what is your responsibility? I ask myself as a white person doing that through a black medium and being thoughtful about that. I think the way you do it is by being not making it a parody and making sure your the songs even if they were about something else like what like partying or something a mainstream thing like a dance move like that those if it sounded good even not being a uh, song about about mm-hmm. um for example George Orwell, right? It has to exist well. The, it can't just be a gimmick. I think one of the issues with nerdcore is that so much of it trades on the fact that there's a built-in fandom for whatever you're rapping about that people don't try to make actually musical banging songs. And that's a broad generalization. But I think if you can make a song fun and I, I really like the idea of juxtaposition, like if you take a story that's really sad and make it really funny, that's a way for people to want to um, learn more about that. Like what's an example of that on, on, on Dewey Decibel? I mean, 1984. Well, no, that's a sad song about something Sad. Okay, here's an example. The Watchmen, our song about The Watchmen is kind of a fun, happy, old school song about a, a book, a graphic novel that's notoriously dark and um, kind of the origin of the antihero in 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 graphic novel um, literature, one of them at least. So it's like you got to make sure that 
how you tell it is just as important as the story you're writing about. And you have to make sure you don't do like a fact dump. You have to get into the head of the mm-hmm. characters and make it fun and human and fresh and uh, make it so they can't get the chorus out of their heads. Because otherwise, you know, people, you want people to like the song, even if they don't care about books. Because if you can't do that, you shouldn't be, you just write an essay about the book. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Huh. I didn't think I the last part I didn't really think of it that way. The Watchman one has gotten stuck in my head. I literally can the hook, the dun dun is always in my head. Um so Thanks, man. So since you started doing this, do you think the outlook on nerds and geeks just in general has changed? Like in culture? Well, yeah, yeah, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. And I think about that and I know it being political is too boring, but I think about like the 2016 election, how the idea of how certain memes were co-opted for certain political aims made it so these people, the whole idea of these people behind keyboards, you know, the libertarian element became kind of scary, the power you could wield. When before being a nerd felt, it went from being kind of like you were dissed by society, then it was clear that you were able to do things for society and you were heroes, to then becoming potentially villains and all these stories about like what's what's s- sick about our society manifesting in people's action. I think now being a nerd is just being someone who's either passionate about popular culture or fluent with certain technology. It's it's really changed. And I think along those lines, it used to be an interesting story. Like, oh, it's a nerd who raps. That's crazy. Let me listen to this guy. And now everyone is a freaking nerd who raps. So <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? It's like nerd culture to be a nerd is just to be someone living in the 21st century. Everyone's, everyone's a gamer. Everyone has a candy crush or some sort of like game on their phone. Like, you know, that might be a weird example, but everyone can name an mm-hmm. Avenger. So it's not special to be a nerd anymore. And it's actually like, if someone's a nerd, it's, I'm kind of like, all right, well, Tell me about what you like. I don't care about, you know, I'd be, rather have a conversation about their interests. Um, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because that, that that delineation is, I think it's changed so much in, in the 20 years I've been doing this. I mean, I don't know. I think it's become less of a label and like more, less of a label and someone's identity and more of like, oh, like, what are you into? Rather than yeah. if you're a nerd, you automatically play Dungeons and Dragons. It's like, no, like there is room for, um, like kind of a diversity under that kind of flag. It's just like, there's like, you can be into different things. So actually getting to know the person and understand what they're into is like a huge part of that now. And I think the world is a little bit more willing to do that. Would you say so? Yeah. And I would also think that it's, I would also say that it's gone so far as like the nerd culture has been so co-opted kind of like quote mm-hmm. unquote wokeness has become something that corporations try to show that they're down with, which is, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. Like being down with nerd culture, that's you, like the whole thing. Here's a good example with the Wall Street Bet subreddit and the game, the GameStop thing. It's like if you, it's like there's so much money tied up in nerd branding now, billions mm-hmm. of dollars. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, well, there's algorithms based on that exist to decipher what our history is and what specific type of nerds we are, so we can spend more money on that brand. And that no one I think expected. And that is cool, but it's also this this whole constructivist learning AI thing that if you look at developmental psychology, puts us in these silos of like if I'm a if I'm an ICP fan, my algorithms are going to be showing me ICP records and they're not going to be yep. showing me other stuff. And that, so I'd rather have a, that's what's so fun about touring. You can talk about this stuff versus being online bombarded mm-hmm. in a way that, that is kind of gross sometimes, but inevitable. And everyone's got to make money and like nerds who make money off of their art. Like that's so dope. I'm all for that, you know? So a part of that, when you're writing and creating all these things, what do you think is important to you to make a connection with your audience? Oh boy. That's something I think about (laughs) a lot now. And during COVID, it's been interesting because I've had a lot of time, but I've uh, not really put out a lot of music outside of my Patreon, which is a different kind of approach that differently. I always, I I think I mentioned this earlier, like you always have to approach songwriting like a paper. Your thesis has to be interesting, meaning that becomes your hook. Why am I writing the song and why am I the person to write this? I have to like think about if I'm going to write a song about 
if I'm going to write a song about, um, for example, well, I did a song about, okay, I did a song about episode four, right, for my Patreon. And I wrote it from the perspective of Owen Lars, not just because I like his name, but because <laughs> he, you know, his his story is he doesn't want, spoiler alert, he doesn't want Luke Skywalker <laughs> to become a Jedi because he's aware Gosh, of what man, happened. It, I, I was planning on getting around to watching that still. Oh, I know it's been like 40 years, but... Yeah, episode four. So I think it's a good way, good place to start. Uh, he doesn't want he doesn't want Luke to end up like his stepbrother, right? Who obviously had some missteps. So I so I wrote the song from the perspective of Owen Lars trying to be protecting Luke, telling him you should just be happy. You're a moisture farmer. Um, you know, I don't want to hear about your Jedi in, ambitions. Like we have work to do. It's it's already sunrise. Both suns are in the in the sky. Let's get to work, right? And <laughs> I I, I th- wrote that perspective as a father talking to my son, like thinking about, man, I don't know if I would want you to be a rapper and go out and tour and be doing the stuff I did. Cause it's kind of risky and dangerous. And so I have to put some of myself into the story. If I'm using pop culture as a trope, because there's nothing worse than this Wikipedia raps where you're just listing all the facts about a character. People are going to listen to that and people are going to pay you for that. And people are going to want to hear that song. It shows that those songs it shows, but there's no personal element in that. And I think, that's very important. Every artist needs to think, why am I writing this song? And, and, and why, why am I the person to write about this now? And when our cult, where, where speed and acceleration is the thing that defines our culture more than the fact that the culture is accelerating, the, the culture is acceleration. So we have to constantly put out stuff. It's so easy to lose track of that. And I think artists from my generation are less prolific because it's like they want to have meaning in everything and they want to tell their own story. I, I like writing these lit hop songs because I'm able to tell my story through another character. And how do I do that? I really have to think about how I relate to this or that character. And um, that's that's why I love Kerouac because I'm definitely not trying to c- compare myself to him because, <laughs> but, but, he, but he was so awesome the way he, I think the literary term is Roma, Romana Clef is when you take you, you, you change the names of the characters so you can tell an autobiographical story and therefore you absolve yourself of having to be completely factually accurate. Like on the road, all the characters' names are changed and that's why it's interesting because he plays with, um, he plays with the narrative. And Stephen King talks about you got to find the truth in the lie. That's what fiction is. You find the truth in telling a made-up story and I try to do that with all, the, all of my songs. So... Yeah, that's how I approach it. So that's why I've been not putting out a lot of stuff now because I'm definitely thinking about this stuff more and more <laughs> every day. I think it's yeah. good to have that filter, though. You know, as opposed to just putting out like everything and then it's like, does that, you know, none just of, like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I and think it's uh, one album a year is an okay output. And I think that's like, if you're doing a song every two weeks, you're going to have you're going to have 26 songs and pick your best 10. And there you go. Like you just got to be disciplined about it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And now that you, you mentioned earlier that you do teach people and, um, do like seminars and stuff like that. How is it for you to teach someone your craft? How does it feel? Um, it makes me think about, the process more, which is why this podcast has really been interesting talking to both of you, because these are things I try to, I haven't been able to verbalize a lot of my process until I've started working with, I have five students now who I meet regularly every two weeks. I meet privately with each of them. And I, so I really enjoy it because I think that there are concrete things about the craft, which, um, you can actually pass on. I'm actually doing a master's, um, right now in um, instructional science and technology through Cal State University, Monterey Bay. And so my thesis is I'm working with a rural school in Northern California on actually how to construct their own podcast, which is going to become like their yearbook. And so a lot of the things I'm learning and and working on that project with these kids relate to how I do my lit hop courses. Um, And so it's really fun because yeah, like there's a theme in education about spiraling. You always want to try to spread out and try to make sure what you do builds on itself scaffolding. And I, and that's really, mm-hmm. really fun to see what my students do because they impress me and I learn a lot from them. And, um, 
Yeah, it's it's fine. Good use of the word scaffolding. Like nice psych term. Thank you. Um so <laughs> to wrap off our questions, we have another hard one for you. If you had a Rube Goldberg machine, what would it do? My Rube Goldberg machine. So can I describe the pieces of it? Yes, Go for absolutely. It. All right. Uh, and I'll I'll reverse engineer it for you. So the final oh, the, the final product is an anonymous person listening to a finished album start to finish. So that I made. So the whole most of the work I think of independent artists now and Mike as a musician I I'm sure you feel me on this is like thinking about how you're going to get your project heard. And that can be yeah. so daunting and stultifying and that can suck all the joy from the jump before yes. you even start. So I'd have, I'd want to have my, my group Goldberg machine, know where all my advertising dollars are going, know what platforms are people are going to want mar music marketed to them on, whether it's TikTok this week or Instagram reels or whatever, like have all that set. So it's all, all whether you hire a publicist or whatever, all the business, you press a button. And so it sends emails to the right people, at the right time. It automatically <laughs> launches the Kickstarter. So you're not spending your life savings to try to Take pay Facebook. Right. <laughs> Take it a step further. Have it like introduce some kind of AI that knows what the right time in their life is to hear your album so that it's the most impactful it can possibly be. Yeah. And what, and right. That's if, th yeah. Right time, right time they, of the day they get the email or like if they have to wait till they're 15 to hear about it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All your fans. If, if I can give you uh, parts and pay you for labor, can you make two of these? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, we can patent it. I think this could be a, a big, uh, a big hit. Um, everything. And then, and like you have a bird that flies across the, uh, room and drops off the tax form so you can deduct the right things for your LLC. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's already filled out. And, and then that bird also pays the accountant. So what you have is, a uh, from the jump, a, uh, <laughs> you know, your project is going to get the best promotional effort possible so the part that's not part of the rube goldberg machine is the part of you in a room where you're spending the time making the actual art and putting your heart into it and not tripping on this stuff so when I mean, you're done you press a button and that button also the part of the rube goldberg machine would be the up uploading the files to TuneCore or DistroKid or whatever and um sending the email marketing it to your friends in a non-annoying way and knowing who you shouldn't text because it's nothing worse than getting a text from someone about their new video that you don't really talk too much because that's a so knowing who who yes knowing all your who friendships cares? as well as their age right like yeah you want that be able to take the human elephant and elephant the elephant in the room is to make the human element <laughs> the central part of the room yeah. machine and guess Beautiful what you turn need, around you need to upgrade it every Every 10 minutes, probably you have to rebuild it. Right. <laughs> That's my machine. Listen, I, I totally feel you were right to say at the beginning that like, I'd feel you on it. Cause like being an independent musician, like I work a full-time job. It's not my gig to be a musician, but I held off on really putting out a complete work of music. It was a five track EP that I finally put out a couple of years ago for so long. I held off on doing anything like that for that very reason that there's that little voice in your head that just goes like, yeah, but does anyone care who's going to listen to it? Like, what's the, what's the point? And, uh, you know, once I did it, I was glad, but it, it, that really is a obstacle to get over for sure. Good work, Mike. I mean, that takes courage. And that's, <laughs> I feel like part of my Thanks. lit hop courses, I, I try to get into everyone's head and cycle analyze what is, what is stopping them? Because the, all these people, they have to apply to apply to my school. You have to send me like an application and I request five demos and this and that. Okay. So I don't bring, I don't take on people who I don't think have the potential, but, but you know, I mean, I, I do feel like everyone, everyone has something that stops them. So what is that? There's gotta be this, you go in there like, like, um, I'm trying to think about Mario in one of the original in the original Mario game with the hammer. Break up those blocks, the writer's blocks, and uh, you yeah. can be like Mike and put out that five song EP and not worry about it. You're talking Mario. You're speaking my language, so it's working. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the other thing about Mario: you can't go backwards with that stuff, right? It's Mario One. I mean, the Mario Two. Yeah, I guess, no, three. 
yeah, but you're getting you're you're going deep. With the, it's great. I love it. <laughs> Thank you all for. I feel like I, I know I've been. I'm looking at my waveform and logic. I've been talking for the majority of this. Listen, I I, I wanted it. to say this sometime earlier, and I didn't want to interrupt you at any point. But I I have enjoyed this so much just because you're you've been so fearless about just like getting so deep into the craft of everything and the technical aspects of things, and I just think that's so interesting because. Uh, you know, some people can be a little like they don't want to speak too much on their craft because they're afraid of, you know, like they want to retain their value. Right. Like they they don't want to, like, have their their ideas or their methods stolen from them or something. So they they hold back. But um, it, just the fact that you were so open and, and willing to, like, touch on so many different points is just this was just such a blast to listen to. Thanks, man. We all both you both have really good questions and I appreciate you respecting me enough to, like, ask thoughtful questions and um yeah it's it's cool your your po- i was looking at checking out your podcast y'all are, your 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 reviews and everything is amazing for like the time you've been doing this and the reaction you've been getting like good work i'm impressed <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Doing thank it you. Right. That, means, that means a lot <laughs> yeah genuinely thank you that's that is uh, I, I like yeah oh man <laughs> so uh lars where can people find you and what's your patreon Thanks, Dan. Um, MCLars.com is the portal for everything. Patreon.com slash MCLars. I'm putting out two Star Wars songs a month. I'm doing a series called Lars Wars, where I'm doing a rap song about everything in the Star Wars universe. Um, Right now, I'm about to do Empire Strikes Back, and then I'm doing Ewok's Caravan of Courage. So it's completely chronological, and I'm going through to the Lego Star Wars special. I just dropped a song about the original holiday special, and then I'm doing, I'm going to end with the lego holiday special and i started with gosh i think i how far back did i go i've got i went back to the beginning so check that out because you can't hear that anywhere else but on the patreon you can find us at gatecrashers.fan and on all of our social medias at gatecrashers pod catch you next week (laughs) 